first just to say thank you to everyone who's taken part in this amazing and excellent conference and the organizers it's been really inspiring um, and the second thing to say is I'm not going to show any extracts because that felt like a step too far but I have attempted to show quite a few screenshots um, and at the end I think Andrea mentioned there might be the possibility of a bibliography and I'll share the websites where you can watch some of them. Um, so Chantal Ackerman was born in Brussels in 1950, the older daughter of two Holocaust survivors originally from Poland, Natalia, known as Nelly, um, and Jacob. Um, her mother's family arrived in Belgium before war broke out, but they were deported back to Poland and to Auschwitz after the Nazis' invasion, where Nelly lost most of her family, including her parents. Jacob's parents survived in hiding. The daughter, Chantal, shot to fame as a film director, particularly in 1975 after her feature, Jeanne Dielman, um, her statements about the centrality of her mother and to quote Ang Harrod's phrase from earlier, the harnessing of ordinariness in all her films, including this one, have become legendary. Tragically, Ackerman, who suffered from bipolar disorder, committed suicide in 2015, a year after her mother's death. I hope to bring out the ways in which it's, it's impossible, but in a fruitful way, to separate Ackerman's devotion to her mother Nellie's status as a Holocaust survivor and the significance of her daughter's filmic works, which pay homage to her. In the preface to Ackerman's memoir, My Mother Laughs, which I really highly recommend, Daniela Schreier says that the filmmaker existed at the intersection of several marginal identities as a woman, a lesbian, a Jew, and someone of the second generation. But Ackerman's work, is most often associated with avant-garde avant women's cinema rather than the second generation. Critics have nonetheless sometimes seen traces of Ackerman's parents' history in many of her works on apparently quite different subjects, including her documentary South from 1999 about the murder of an African-American man, James Byrd in Texas, and also from the East of 1993 about the early years of post-communist Poland and Russia. But I'm going to talk about two films which centre more explicitly on the Holocaust experience of her mother's generation to suggest that Ackerman's second generation status was conveyed in specifically filmic terms. These films are Tell Me, a 45 minute documentary of interviews with survivors broadcast on French television in 1980 and Ackerman's final work, No Home Movie of 2015, centering on her mother. Although they're both documentaries, they're also examples of art cinema. To start with Tell Me, this was commissioned for a television series in France on grandmothers. It's available to view on the French National Audiovisual Institute website um, and the English subtitles are available separately and it's not very often either screened, viewed or written on. In the film, Ackerman is shown visiting three unnamed women who are Holocaust survivors from Poland and Russia now living in Paris. In keeping with the series theme, they are grandmothers who return to memories of their own grandmothers, conveying rupture rather than continuity. In between each of the filmed encounters, we hear the recorded voice of Ackerman's mother, Nellie, although we never see her, reciting details in turn about her grandmother. By this means, the viewer learns about a world that was not only destroyed, but also very distant, even in 1980. One woman describes the death of her grandmother in 1917. Ackerman's Tell Me precedes Claude Lansman's film Shoah by five years, and she later said she had never dared to watch it but is a valuable contrast to his much better known work with its focus on male members of the Sonderkommando and the processes of the extermination camps. Like Lanceman, Ackerman is present throughout the film. She uses 
no archive footage to stand in for that of the past, but one woman sings Yiddish folk songs from the pre-war era in an instance of bodily recall also used in Shoah, and stories about food are echoed in the present as Ackerman is exhorted to eat in one instance in an exchange for the story, the woman says to her, eat or I won't tell you the rest. But by contrast to Lanceman, Ackerman's interviewees' memories give precedence to everyday life, including childbirth, cooking, their own children, sewing and folk wisdom, showing that domestic lives undervalued by cinema as well as histories of the Holocaust perhaps, were also ravaged by the forces of history. Each of the three women in Ackerman's films contrasts visually, suggesting I feel there's a very visual aspect to the second generation viewpoint. Um, just to go back to this one, you can see there's a kind of sparse modern aesthetic with a reflective table surface, contrasting to the second interviewee, um, who's shown with only a pale, plain backdrop. We never see the rest of her house. Um, and the third one, um, in an abrupt contrast, in a room full of images of the past and wearing red. As the title Tell Me suggests, Ackerman herself is a part of the story as director, interviewer, and second generation daughter. The film opens with a static shot of her emerging from the Paris Metro as cars shoot past, suggesting both her primary role in orchestrating the film, but also her uncertainty, even perhaps the fact that in this film about maternal grandmothers, she does not have one. As Ackerman walks towards the first woman's apartment, looking around her, we hear the off-screen voices of the daughter and her mother, um, which I've identified here, but they are not identified in the film itself, showing the inseparability of the question about grandmothers with loss during the Holocaust, and which is the Holocaust itself is a word that is never used. So the first words we hear are Ackerman saying, tell me, Maman, what memories do you have of your mother? To which her mother replies, she was 35 years old when she was deported. My grandmother did everything to keep us warm in a nest like that. When I came back from the camp, I came back to my grandmother's house. Apart from this opening, tell me, which is also the title, we do not hear Ackerman's questions to the women. Instead, seeing her listening with what one reviewer calls a soft sphinx-like smile but we gain a sense of the open nature of what Ackerman has asked the women. Um, from her opening comments and their responses, one of them says, I don't have much to tell you. Whereas another one says, I could speak for eight days. In visual terms, we get another sense of her questions. Um, we see Ackerman approaching doors, looking up at balconies and ascending stairs, conveying filmically her role as one gaining access to the eyewitnesses who now inhabit and are to some extent hidden in the Paris cityscape. Once inside their Paris apartments, shots of the elderly women and the director alternate in spaces full of reflective surfaces mirrors and tabletops. You can just about see the mirror there, I think. Adding to the convincing illusion that no one else is in the room. In the last and longest interview, Ackerman is invited to stay for dinner and we see the older woman at work in the kitchen. These apparently ordinary details echo the use of such episodes in her original film, Jeanne Dielman, where the kitchen sequences were themselves based on the routines of Ackerman's mother. As you can see on the slide, Ackerman knits herself further into the women's narratives in her own brief utterance. The third woman says, and you, do you have a grandmother, a grandfather? Ackerman says, I don't have anyone, they all vanished. 
um, and the word in French is disparu, they disappeared in the war. The third woman says, like me, the whole family vanished. So there's an irony in this film's focus on the, the third generation before. At the conclusion to the last and longest of the interviews, we see a two shot of Ackerman and the older woman as they watch television over dinner and the director seems to nod off, increasing the sense of immediacy. Her final words in response to the other woman's invitation to stay the night are, I must go home, in French rentrée or I must return, suggesting that she will now try to leave the world of the past. A critic says, as I've quoted here, of Ackerman's visits to the older women's present day homes in Tell Me that there's something jarring in the rhythm of everyday life going on while the women recount stories of world rending loss. This deliberate jarring and other aspects of the earlier film come to fruition in the later example, No Home Movie. As its title suggests about having no home the film was edited from 40 hours of footage taken of Ackerman's mother, Nellie, in her Brussels apartment, filmed on a digital camera, phone and laptop. So in this case, there is no crew present. As you can see, I hope in that screenshot, the camera is often put down on a surface and allowed to record independently. Again, we hear dialogue about food, the absence of mustard and Chantal's childhood reluctance to eat, leading without transition into history so that Nellie describes the insidious onset, as she puts it, of the German occupation of Belgium, like a knife through butter, and Chantal's insistence on the Nazi sympathies of the Belgian king, casting further ironic light on the nature of what home is. Her second generation viewpoint is presented visually. While Ackerman is often present in some form, in this scene, as you can see in that image, we see her only from behind, Nellie's face visible over her daughter's shoulder, encapsulating the fact that we see it through the second generation perspective. At other moments, Ackerman, whose face we very rarely see anyway, is not visible at all because she's either on the other end of a phone or talking to her mother on Skype. So that we see Nellie's face on her daughter's computer screen and we're placed in this position, as it were, of Ackerman herself. While this enhances the sense of a home movie, these techniques also show Ackerman's role in the film as a member of the second generation as her mother's dialogue partner and a filmmaker. Nellie's story as a mother and a survivor only emerges through her daughter in both these senses. The film therefore presents Nellie's biography as part of her relationship with her daughter. These strands are inextricable and the details of her wartime history emerge through these means. On the phone, when we can't see her, we hear Chantal claim that Nellie's mother in pre-war Poland was in love with another man, the lawyer who provided her family with the papers to emigrate from Poland to Belgium in 1939. While Nellie seems to defend her mother in claiming that the lawyer's role meant that all was in order, the daughter contests the lawyer's suitability, calling it a waste of time. It would have been better, she says, if Nellie's family had come earlier and without papers. This combination of family law and historical tragedy is continued in a scene where an invisible Chantal talks to Clara, who you can see on the other side of the screenshot, um, who is her mother's carer, whose questions about the family can only be answered in relation to a broader history as well as questions of home. As Chantal puts it in a, a mixture of French and Spanish, her mother was originally from Poland in answer to Clara's question, but it was very hard there because of the people. So Nellie fled here. 
but the SS captured them and sent them back to Poland to a concentration camp. That's why my mother is like that, Auschwitz. This episode, which would be central to any conventional survivor testimony, emerges only in this oblique and fragmented way, told by the daughter in an informal domestic setting from which Nellie herself is absent. She's sleeping in her bedroom. Finally, in this particular image, Nellie's absence is the note on which the film ends, the white empty foyer and the image of the two rooms, a symbol of her death in April 2014, just before the film was released. To conclude, in the case of Chantal Ackerman, it's impossible to separate the filmmaker from the loving daughter and the second generation witness. Ackerman's being welcomed into the living rooms of the women in Tell Me and her seat at the kitchen table in No Home Movie emerge from these inextricable roles. The critic Griselda Pollock has argued against reading Ackerman's films only in autobiographical terms. But his second generation filmic perspective is inevitable in the sense that for her to engage with the figure of the mother is to engage with a survivor. If a second generation film of aesthetics of this kind can be identified with its own archival impulse, we might compare Ackerman with other second generation examples. And we're going to hear more about that in the next talk, including for instance, the Austrian director, Ruth Beckermann, who has made films about the Wehrmacht's crimes, Kurt Waldheim and Paul Salam, and also Pierre Sauvage, a French child survivor who's made films on the village of Chambon, where he and his parents were hidden, and also about the American campaigner, P Peter Bergson, and no doubt other examples, all working to make visible the traces of the past in the present. Thank you. In the 1990s and in the first decade of the new millennium, films by filmmakers of the second and even third generation to the Holocaust were motivated by negotiationist positions, as well as by gradual disappearance of Holocaust survivors and witnesses. Such are the Brothers Kling, Heritage from 1996, Emanuel Finkel's Voyage 1999 and Casting from 2001, as well as Marceline Loridan events, Le Petit Prairie au Boulou from 2002, and Robert Thalheim's Aunt and Common Touristen from 2007. Regina Michal Friedman defines these films, documentary or not, as blurring the boundaries between documentary and fictional representation, promoting personal and uniquely creative visions. I argue that what makes these creative visions so unique is the conflation of aesthetics with ethics, which has become an imperative for the third generation because it is this generation that struggles with the void, lack and emptiness left by the gradual disappearance of survivors and witnesses, namely the real, the referent. Made in Israel in 2011, Arnon Goldfinger's highly acclaimed documentary, The Flat, i.e. The Apartment, provides a powerful example. I wish to show you now the beginning of the film, a short clip. This is my grandmother, Gerda. A month ago, she died. Since then, no one has been here. Everything remains as it was. Now we have a difficult task to decide what stays and what goes. While emptying the apartment of his grandmother's after her death at age 98, 
Goldfinger discovers that after the war, his grandparents, Gerda and Kurt Tuchler, renewed a pre-war friendship with an aristocrat German couple, the von Middelsteins. Von Middelstein was already a member of the Nazi party in 1929 and a senior SS officer since 1932. The Tuchlers arrived in Palestine in 1936 and lived in their Tel Aviv apartment until their respective deaths. Goldfinger sets out to uncover the nature of this unimaginable friendship. Furthermore, he contacts von Middelstein's daughter, Edda, and learns from her that his great grandmother, Susanna Lehmann, was murdered in the camps. This fact was never mentioned in the family, and Goldfinger, striving to uncover the past, raises questions that the second generation, his mother Hannah and Edda von Middelstein, had never dared ask. Faced with no first-hand memory or witnesses, the second generation that dares not ask, Goldfinger used a variety of artistic devices unconventional in documentaries. His quest constitutes an ethical response as in Levinas's notion of responsibility, the ability to respond, in this case, to an absence, manifested in the aesthetic mode of remembering and representing the dead. I would like to show you now um, further uh, from the beginning sequence. When I was a kid, I liked to come here. Once a week, I'd cross the streets of Tel Aviv, climb up the stairs, and find myself in Berlin. My grandmother lived here for 70 years as if she had never left Germany. Despite the years in the Holy Land, she never mastered Hebrew, and I didn't want to learn German. So we'd sit and chat in English over apple strudel and Swiss chocolate. When I grew up, I realized that the meaningful things were always left unspoken. The flat approaches the question of trauma and memory of the Holocaust by juxtaposing two generations. The filmmaker's mother represents the second generation to the Holocaust, which inherited the silence of the parents. The director represents the third generation, determined to break this silence by investigating into the traumatic past. The film moves along two axes, the emptying of the Goldfing Goldfinger's grandparents' apartment and his quest. Both are conveyed through, an Im through the imagery of the apartment. Once occupied, sorry, once empty of both objects and subjects, the apartment becomes a symbol of the silence past, as well as a symbol of resisting denial and negation. This use of symbolism, together with the unique employment of the Tuchler's portraits, functions as a bridge between generations, between past and present, enforcing second-handed witnessing and giving rise to an ethics of listening. Marian Hirsch, um, sorry, Marianne Hirsch's acclaimed notion of post-memory, mentioned uh, many times in this conference, although characterized by an omnipresent absence, is nevertheless based on a direct encounter with a Holocaust survivor or witness, who, like a Levinasian other, generates the ethical response. Goldfinger's quest, representing the memory work of filmmakers belonging to the third generation, lacks this direct face-to-face sorry, with direct face-to-face -face confrontation with the past. The ethical call arises not from the uncovering of any past traumatic truth or event which could result with such an encounter, but from insisting <clears throat> on investigating it by establishing a unique aesthetic dialogue between documentary film and art. As we saw, Kurt Stuckler's portrait is filmed from an ominously low angle. Goldfinger's parent, grandparents are gone but the editing encourages us to interpret it as symbolic and as a silent dialogue that breaks the silence between the representatives of the third generation of the Holocaust and their grandparents. A dialogue between the gaze of the portraits, the past, and the gaze of the camera, the present, reframing thus the past. The Tuchler's portraits that open and close the opening sequence as we saw, and also reappear in other significant moments in the flat, raises the question, how does the mise en function in a documentary film, in particular 
one concerned with Holocaust and familial memory. The image of the apartment and its objects in the opening sequence are thus encapsulations of the film's themes, the metonymic documentary that tells the story of emptying a concrete apartment of its worldly goods also functions as a metaphor. It underscores how the past can easily be erased, especially now when the Holocaust survivors are no longer with us. The medium itself, its form and vocation are also duplicated similarly to the play within a play in Shakespeare's Hamlet, considered by scholars as a paradigmatic mise en abyme. The Tuchler's portrait are a picture within a picture. Throughout, they are juxtaposed, juxtaposed with crucial points in time, when Goldfinger learns new things about his past, creating thus a meta-dialogue between the gaze of the camera and that of the portraits. In Hamlet, the purpose of the play within the play is to act out the unwitnessed murder of Hamlet's father and make the murderer, the king, succumb to his feelings of guilt. Indeed, he does react to the play within the play. He retreats to his chambers where he confesses, a confession witnessed only by the audience. The common element between the Hamlet mise en abyme and the Flats mise en abyme is that the weight of responsibility rests entirely on the playwright director's shoulders, as well as the spectators. The portrait and the camera have a power to generate responsibility, the ability to respond, but not to provide testimony. Gerda and Court's portraits, which strategically constitute an integral part of Goldfinger's use of family photographs, reflects his desire throughout the film to position himself as a bridge to, to his mother's past. The portraits, as it were, split up into two trajectories characterizing the film's episode. The first trajectory, Goldfinger relates to his grandfa grandfather's portrait, a respectable judge, by interviewing other male authoritative figures. Their interviews are an attempt to understand the actions related to his grandparents through logic and historical facts. The second trajectory relates to his grandmother's portrait. He interviews women. These are more conversational in nature, in which he tries to understand the absence of emotion that characterizes his mother and Edda von Mildenstein. In the clip we will see now, Goldfinger tries uns unsuccessfully to make his mother respond to letters he found from his great grandmother, Susanna Lennon, that uh, died in the camps. The drama that followed Susanna's return to Germany unfolds letter after letter. My grandmother and her mother corresponded continuously, up to the moment Susanna was forced to leave her home and was deported to the ghetto. My dear children, I received your letter, and as always I'm happy to hear from you. Day by day my solitude worsens, there is not much left to do. But I refuse to lose hope that one day we shall see each other again. After this, Goldfinger confronts with his mother and asks her to read letters and identify them. את יודעת שמצאתי מכתבים ממנה? יהיה לי בן. אני בריאה וקר פה מאוד. אני נמצאת בחנות החל מהראשון לדצמבר. אה, אני כבר לא בחנות מהחל מהראשון לדצמבר. פה היא כותבת ש... ‫הכנה לי החביבה, תחשוב על הסבתא, ‫ושהיא מקווה שהיא עוד תראה אותנו. ‫אני לא בטוחה שזה ממנה. ‫זה לא ממנה. ‫לא יודעת, כי היה לנו, ‫היה במשפחה עוד... אני לא חושבת שזה ממנה. פה היא כותבת שאני לא אשכח אותה ושאני לא אגדל כל כך מהר כדי שהבגדים לא יהיו קטנים עליי. זה חייב להיות ממנה, זה עם כל המכתבים היה. יכול להיות. דס גליפטה הנעליים, חנה להם החביבה, זוליה. ‫אני איש 
aufhören, für, für Oma zu beten. Das ist ein Schalom, Schlafsieg, Lied, Palel, Le, La Safta, Ki, der liebe Gott wird schon helfen. Schalom, ja, so. Schalom, Schlafsieg, Lied, Palel, Kedei, Schalom, ja, so. התפללת בשבילה? לא. לא. אני חושבת עליכם, ושרו בריאים, ואלס, אלס, 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 קוטף, יאוש, עומדי, קליפ, קידה, אוירה, אוש, ליבס, אה, זוזי, כן, זוזי, זה היא. זה כן היא. מעניין. In my mother's photo album, I find evidence of Susanna Lehmann's visit to Tel Aviv. Three generations of women in one photograph, unaware that this is the last picture they will ever take together. Goldfinger starts out by reading the letters in his voiceover. In the original version, it is in Hebrew. But here he translates it to English, but not in caption. He reads it aloud. Then we see and hear his mother reading one letter addressed to her, translating it from German into Hebrew. Gradually, the German takes over, resurrecting thus Goldfinger's mother's mother tongue, German. This brings Susanna's words, almost gone and forgotten, <clears throat> from the past into his mother's present existence. Goldfinger's mother tongue is Hebrew, therefore he lacks direct access to his silent past Remember his description at the beginning of the film regarding the language gap between him and his grandmother. Through his own reading now, Goldfinger thus attempts to fulfill Susanna's last request addressed to her estranged granddaughter, do not forget me. It is as though Susanna's voice and her subjectivity return to engage in the dialogue. This can only be achieved in film. And this is, now, this is how Goldfinger strives to engage the viewer in his attempt to give a voice to the dead and forgotten. We will see now another clip where he visits Berlin, uh, where his cousin lives, and they go to visit uh, his great-grandmother, Susanna Lehmann, um, um, sister-in-law, Paula Lehmann's house. Afternoon has come, and in Berlin, do as the Berliners do. After Schlafstunde, time for Spazieren. Anna? Hey, bitte. Würdest du hier wohnen? Nein. Hier nicht? Hier nicht. Hier nicht. Ja. Außerdem wohnen will ich, wo ich wohne. Aber ich ja. wäre gerne für die hat, die hat Paula, Zeit Hier hat Paula gewohnt. Das ist Paulas Wohnung. Ja? Hier. Ah, das weiß ich nicht. Hier ist Paula. Künzelstraße hm. ja. 45. Das war das last apartment? Ja. Yes. Wow. Ja. And here, look, there's a Stolperstein to memory. Uh, well, Paula Lehmann, here. No. Yeah. I didn't know that they put such. Kannst du es lesen? Hier yes. wohnte Paula Bernstein, geborene Lehmann, Jahrgang 1867, deportiert, deportiert. nach 1902, deportiert 1942 nach Theresienstadt, ermordet Dezember 42. It's an artist who had the idea, mm -hmm. an artist, and then either a family or a friend or somebody pays, for, pays for this, and then you have to ask and the community, for, and this is for Paula. This, and that's is for for, Paula. this is for Paula. Paula Lehmann isn't my only relative who lived here. The home of Susanna Lehmann was a quick walk away. When Susanna would go to visit her sister-in-law, she'd take little Hanale along to show off her granddaughter. Please notice this circle movement of the camera. Yeah, the show, the game. Um, as we saw this last shot, um, Goldfinger subtle use of match cut in editing and the turning of Hannah's head accompanied by the circling, embracing camera movement, 
implies that he wishes to place his mother in the same position that she had been while in her grandmother's arms in Berlin. Will she express emotions now? His mother, however, remains unemotional. In this respect, Hannah is an example of what Helen Epstein terms, quote, Lot's wife, especially in respect to the second generation. Fear of turning around and looking back, lest he or she might turn into a pillar of salt. The sequence shows Goldfinger's post memory as third generation. This indeed differs from the survivor's memory in both its temporal and symbolic meanings. As Hirsch notes, the textual nature of both memory relies on images, stories, and documents passed down from one generation to the next. Furthermore, the term post memory is meant to convey its temporal and qualitative difference from survivor's memory. It has a secondary, transgeneral quality that is rooted in displacement, vicariousness, and belatedness. Post memory is a powerful form of memory precisely because. Its connection is to object or source is mediated not through recollection, but through, quote, representation, projection, and creation, often based on silence rather than speech, on the invisible rather than the visible, end of quote. Goldfinger uses the photographs of Susanna and Hannah together as a trace or index or a footprint, conveying thus a material, physical, extremely potent connection between the generations. Susan and Hannah were there together, now they are not. Someone has to remember and acknowledge this. Goldfinger, therefore, uses the animated sign of footprints and sound on the 1932 map of Berlin as a representation of Susanna's literal footprints. This is, as it were, a symbol of an index. Since he is denied direct contact with the referent, so are we, he symbolizes it. This is underscored by Goldfinger's other attempts to connect the referent of the past within the, with the present in the film. He, stried, he strives to obtain concrete acknowledgement from Ida regarding her father's past as an SS officer, but fails. And he fails again when he tries to find the gravestone of Susanna's husband, who had died before the war. This failing has the same function as the play within a play in Hamlet, as it calls for responsibility. It is a spectacle of failures. No one in Hamlet sees the king's confession, but the spectators. Goldfinger's mother remains numb, and Edda does not acknowledge her father's responsibility while uncovering the truth. Goldfinger shows Edda's desire to end his investigation when she terminates their final conversation by asking arrogantly, anything else? I would like to show now a clip from the final shot of the film. In conclusion, Goldfinger's ethical aesthetic is based precisely on his persistence in asking as well as showing what is not being acknowledged. It is a refusal to collaborate with denial and silence. The film ends with the empty department, the two portraits hanging on the wall, which Goldfinger takes with him when he leaves. Emptying the apartment may symbolize the desire to empty the past, to do away with it. Goldfinger, however, takes the past with him while resisting this position.
Thank you very much.